we got? 721. Okay. Without pedals. Hi, Mark Renshaw here. Uh, this is the story of my bike. In front of me I have a Specialized S-Works McLaren, a bike that was released in 2011. Specialized turned up the day before Milan San Remo. Uh, they pitched this bike to Matt Goss, myself and Mark Cavendish. I politely declined to ride a new bike the day before Milan <laughs> San Remo and stuck with the bike I was on. But uh, as history knows, Matt Goss went on to ride the bike and win Milan San Remo. So having not raced on the bike and having just built up the bike with the mechanics the night before the race, I uh, said so what better way could they have for, I suppose, announcing or releasing the bike than a win in Milan San Remo with, with Matt Goss. I rode this bike later on in the tour and a few other races um, and it was pretty special at the time to have McLaren uh, you know, dip their toes into the cycling world uh, with some of their technology and carbon layer and that obviously much more uh, wealth of knowledge in Formula One than in the automobile industry than cycling so it was great to have them on board with Specialized back in, in that year. It's great that you tell the story like like it actually happened. If it wasn't coming from the horse's mouth, we'd believe it was just marketing hype. <laughs> uh, it was true. They turned up uh, at about uh, two o'clock on a Friday afternoon <laughs> before Milan San Remo and said, oh, I've got a new frame that we'd like you to, to ride. But as it was, I stuck with my old one. Um, but a, a very, very nice bike back at that time. Maybe it's the original spec, but it definitely looks like a deeper dish rear rim. Uh, everything's original except for the front tyre on this bike. Okay. Um, I think it was, I loaned it to someone and they punctured it. And anyway, we just stuck a, an old tyre on there for now. But uh, pretty much everything else is stock standard on the bike. I raced with an 808 zip rear wheel. You can see it's got ceramic speed stickers all over it. Uh, so all the hubs bottom bracket, uh, all the bearings been upgraded with ceramic speed. Still running a pro handlebar and stem with a traditional bend, uh, Durace group set. Big thing was all the space is out of the head stem to get that lower stack height there. Uh, 404 zip front wheel, uh, laced with a Durace hub. They could do a straight pull and a little bit stiffer wheel uh, with a zip rim and a, a Durace hub. Back then with the DI2 we still had the external mounted battery down under the frame and uh, the rest of the group set Durace. I uh, got a Physique Allianz saddle which you know one of my favourites so um, very very nice bike and probably to this day still a little bit expensive to try and find and buy. <laughs> The McLaren name certainly does bring a lot of kudos to it. If anyone knows anything about motorsport, they know that the facility there is just out of this world. As a key component of the Cavendish Express, were you part of the invite list for McLaren? And have you gone and had a look at that facility? Did you get a buzz out of that? I never went to the facility over in the UK. Never got the opportunity to do that. But um, with, with Cavendish, I did have the opportunity to go to the Monaco Grand Prix as a... Uh, a guest of McLaren, so I got to hang out with um, you know the drivers back at that year. So I got to meet the team, which are, are all big cycling enthusiasts. So still a shiver down my spine that I got to sit in the garage with a Formula One car and you know be amongst it as a, as a big motorsport fan here in Bathurst. It was a great way to start the relationship to come straight out on a. It doesn't matter what company or what bike it is, when they give you something new in the pro peloton, they, uh, they'd like you to be successful and to get a win straight away. And of course, with uh, you know, Durace and all the, the DI2, with all the, the mods we had on it, it was one of the fastest bikes back in that time. It's a 
go to Specialized, you came off, Scott. Like, I would imagine, like, just sort of harking back to what the bikes were, the foil was like back then versus the Venge. Can you give a comparison? I, I guess is my uh, question. Obviously, the geometry was different amongst the bikes. Um, it's gone back a long time now, but just my, my memories of the Venge was that I really liked it compared to the Scott. Um, I think it was, maybe the wheelbase was a little bit longer, a little bit lower. There's something about the handling and the descending that I really liked um, this old style of bench uh, because they changed it up a few years after this. Um, but it was a bike that I used in the mountains and in the sprints. Um, so I was one of the only guys that just ran a single frame all year round rather than switching between you know, the tarmac and the, the bench and, and vice versa amongst all the brands. So I just stuck the year out on one, one style of bike and just worried about that, not about changing. We saw the weight wasn't too bad. Um, for a sprinting bike, it's pretty good. I think we've got a V8 pulling up in the car park. It's certainly churning its uh, motor. I hope it doesn't interfere with the audio. If it does, I'm sorry to everyone. We started talking about the look, then we went to the Giant, and they had integrated seat posts. Then we've come away from that by 2012. But there's still a really elongated, teardroppy, aero seat post. These days, certainly on, for example, the Cervelo Caledonia that I've been riding, it's got a D-shape and they are really got a big, long layback, so they're, they're deliberately trying to get movement out of the seat post, whereas these look as stiff as a board. What's your feeling on sort of trying to get a little bit of comfort out of that? Does that affect you as a racer, as a rider? What do you think um, now as a bike shop owner? Uh, look, it was never about comfort. Um, the only thing comfortable about this bike was the seat. <laughs> like, we're looking at, we've got a big, you know, big Allian uh, lounge cushion here, so, um, you know, it was, the seat was great. The bike uh, was pretty stiff. Uh, definitely gave you a lot of feeling underneath you on the bike. Um, and of course, really well laid up with carbon from McLaren, so they did a good job of that, making it stiff and light. Um, but geometry at Specialized was always pretty good. I do remember just um, struggled to get low enough in the handlebars, that's why there's no spaces on the bike uh, under the stem. But apart from that, remembering the bike, it, uh, it handled really nicely. Should we just uh, talk a little bit about Bob Stapleton? I mean, he's sort of, uh, because we're on an HTC, we've got the jersey in the background, we've got sort of uh, memories of Alan Piper and a real halcyon time in cycling. Like it was, Bob Stapleton changed everything, didn't he? He sort of... Um, he did, he did. He, um, was uh, he was an amazing manager. He, he's, he fought to get us the best equipment in the team and... Um, look, he was always pretty hard as a manager as well, which, uh, you know, I find, I, fi I found really good in my career. Um, you know, the stricter the manager, the, you know, the more expectations we had, of, had, had for results and having Cav in the team, it was always expected to win. But, um, you know, there was races like Tour of California, we turned up one year and, you know, the rumour went around that if we didn't win a stage in the first three stages, someone was going to get sacked. Whether it was a staff member or a rider, but someone was going home. Just as, uh, you know, a bit of a, um, you know, a big axe hanging above everyone's head. So, you know, results were expected. So, when we didn't get the res results, they weren't happy. So, uh, look, it's not a good way of doing it, but I found it effective. Um, and I suppose crossing that over into real life, you know, working in a shop and, and managing and owning a shop, it's not the mentality you can use in business, but in high pressure sporting environment, you know, Brian Holm always said pressure makes diamonds and when you've got a bit of pressure, you, you, get, you get diamonds. When you're a team so successful uh, and so driven and hungry for results, you can't just float along. So there's always pressure in the team, but, um, you know, there's only once a year that the big cards come out that someone was going to get sacked if we didn't win. It was only the most, it was the most important race through California for an American team. So I guess um, probably when push came to shove, no one was going to get sacked, but he wanted the thought there that everyone had to perform and, and we did. So we took wins home and some people probably think it's negative, but I think pressure's, pressure's good in a, in a high level sporting environment. To list all, you know, some of the you know great teammates I had. I started in Francis Dejour, Brad McGee, Matt Wilson, Baden Cook, uh, 
we had Julian Dean there, even though a few years later we had a bit of a tangle in the tour. Um, from there in Pred Agricole, you know, Tor Hushoff, uh, we had some really good international. I got to room with Jan Kersip. Like, <laughs> we actually, um, you know, to, to room with that kind of guy is unreal because we butted heads before I went to Pred Agricole, and the first thing they'd done, they stuck me in a room with him. Um, you know, moving on to, to Quick Step, I raced with Tom Boone and I raced with, you know, all the, all the great guys in, you know, Amiga Farmer, Quick Step and, and those teams and, you know, then to HTC, Tony Martin, Bert Grouch, uh, Eisel, who was a good teammate for a long time. So, uh, Kim Kirsch, and I could just list name after name of, you know, exceptional riders. Michael Kwiatkowski, probably one of the best ever teammates that I had. So, okay. you know... If I was ever going to make up a team, it would have some great names in it. Absolutely. It's, it's a name-dropping uh, contest that uh, you win hands down. No, I do. <laughs> no, the opportunity to race with these guys is incredible. Um, you know, some of them are down to earth, some of them are driven, some, you know, just uh, are, are great guys yeah. and uh, who are more than happy to, to give you a hand. And that's what makes great teams and that's what works so well in the past. If we're talking about the riders while we're talking about the bike, I wonder if you can talk to me about someone who's really particular about his equipment and basically would spend the night sort of hanging out at the um, at the mechanic's truck telling them and instructing um, and being pedantic and readjusting saddles or whatever. Oh, Lou, there are a lot of guys I rode with. Cab was constantly changing things, always, you know. But he also put on a new set of shoes for the... Uh, you know, the 21st stage in the Tour de France down the Arc de Triomphe. He wanted the sprinting green shoes, so he put on new shoes for the day, um, which no one ever does. <laughs> but uh, look, towards the end of my career, I trained a little bit with Sam Bennett, um, and he's constantly changing things. So I'd like to know how he's getting on a quick step there with that mentality because <laughs> they don't like you changing your bike very much. But he was always putting his seat up and down. Okay. Um, but yeah, during my career, I had a lot of guys who were. Uh, pretty pedantic about the weight of the bike uh, and the setup of the bike. Thanks very much for telling a few great stories and giving us some insight that I don't think anyone's published before. It's really cool. No worries,